swirly thing stops swirling. Okay, and this meeting is now being recorded. This is Integration Architecture Study Group Session 2. And we're going to start, since I've asked all of you to get onto the Slack channel, thank you for everybody for registering for that. Um, in the interest of keeping your inboxes, email inboxes slightly less flooded, and to give you exposure to a tool that's used in a lot of different industries in a lot of different ways, uh, we're going to be communicating in Slack. And Terry, since he gave a shout out to Slack at the last meeting, I asked him to put together uh, a quick, quick start. Since we're going to be asking you to use this tool, I thought it was only fair to show you how to use the tool. And so, Terry, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let you start sharing your screen and tell us about Slack. All right. And well, let me un unmute here. I am unmuted. Oh, all right. Very good. <laughs> all right. Hopefully, you can see my Slack um, uh, application opened up on the screen. And um, mine might look slightly different uh, than yours just because I have a variety of other workspaces that um, are from other clients or um, other organizations that have included me on their Slack uh, channels. So you should see a workspace that looks something like this icon here. And uh, that just means you're in the right place. If you do have other uh, workspaces. It's just as simple as, as clicking those, and it moves you into those other uh, other channels, um, just as a simple click. So I'm also on a Mac, and I, I but I believe this looks very similar on the on the Windows environment, and it's also available on in your browser. So if you didn't install the application, you you will I think also have access to it in the in a web browser. Um, I think. And don't hold me to the to this, but I'm pretty sure they all look uh, pretty much the same, uh, regardless of your environment. And uh, Nata uh, Natalia, I think I heard you say that everybody did get um, access to the workspace. Workspace is that true? Yes. Okay, good. So I won't worry about trying to give instructions on how to do that part of it. But um, you've heard me mention the, the term workspace, and, and a workspace is just the environment here that, that you're dealing with. So you see all of these different workspaces that I have access to on the side. Uh, that's all that a workspace is. It's a shared hub where we can communicate with each other. So if you're a part of a workspace, you can communicate with other people who are on that same workspace. And then you get into uh, this next side panel here, and that's where your channels are at. And there's a, there's a couple different types of channels that I wanted, wanted to mention. There's, there's a public uh, channel and then there's a private channel. And you notice the difference primarily by the, hat, by the icon that's next to it. So you've got a general channel here, which is basically open to anyone who has access to the workspace. And then you've got the one with the little lock icon, which means it's a private channel. And you have to be invited uh, to be a, to communicate in a private channel, and I'm assuming uh, we're all in this uh, integration architect. Uh, yeah, you channel. all should be. If for some reason you don't have access to the channel, please let me know, and I will add you. But I believe I set it up so that all the invitations by default got added to that channel. Very good. Now, if you wanted to set up your own own channel, you can do that by creating a channel here. And the first thing it's going to ask you is if it's public or private. Um, if you go private, you do need to invite uh, those uh, members to participate in that. Uh, where you might want to do that is if we start to team up with each other and, and do some studying uh, type things and sharing things back and forth. And, and in a group, we could make that a private channel. That might be one example of where you might use that. The other is um, your direct messages is the next section down. And I'm, I'm a fan of the direct messages. Uh, you can see uh, all of us in, in listed here. And if I click on Natalia's name, you'll see the communication that her and I've had back and forth as well. And it's a way for us to communicate privately um, on, on a given topic. So, um, you can create direct messages um, that include more than one person. Uh, so you can simply go in and, and, and select who you want to direct message to and start communicating with them. So that makes that nice and simple. All right. Um, 
so one of the things here that I wanted to show you is up at the top here, you have the ability to search your messages. So one of the things that I posted last week, or yeah, I think it was this weekend, I was I was doing some studying on the, the tooling API versus the metadata API, and I wasn't real sure what was what. And if I go back and, and just type in a tooling up here in the search, I can come back to some of the, the um, conversation related to that topic. So search is a nice handy way to, um, to go back to a conversation that, that maybe was um, created. You, you knew you talked about it, but you wanted to go back and find it. Uh, search is a great way to do that. Uh, notifications is um, if I were to send uh, Natalia a message here, um, she will get notified of that message. And she'll, she'll see a, an, uh, in fact, Natalia, if you want to message me back, that might be kind of cool to do. Um, and, and I'll get a noti notification indicating that she has messaged me. And you'll see that show up uh, like this here. You'll also see on this workspace up here, I've got a message that I haven't read from uh, another workspace as well. So notifications are very simple to, um, to see uh, within, Sel or within Salesforce, with, <laughs> within Slack. Um, and now, if, uh, as far as messaging each other, it's, it's just like most any other uh, common messaging platforms. You, you have your section down at the bottom of the page where you can uh, simply type in your message. Um, you do have the ability to add files. So if I wanted to share a file, I could, I could certainly do that. I've got the ability to do e emojis and, and fun things along that line. And then I've also got the ability to, to at mention. And I can at mention people by their name. I can also um, at mention a, a group. So let's take, for example, if I'm in the integration ar um, architect group, I've got the ability to say at here. And that will notify everyone that's using their desktop um, that a new message has been um, posted to the channel. So if you if you really want everybody to know know that hey I, I just asked a question um, at here is a good way to do that. Notifies everyone who's online. The other option that I've I've seen people use is the at at channel. And that notifies everyone that's in the channel. And so the difference between the two is, is at here will message those that are online, at channel uh, will notify everybody regardless of whether or not they're currently online or not. So you might be careful with that channel because that channel will, will send a notification to people if they have notifications turned on. Um, it will send a notification even in the middle, of the, you know, whenever. Uh, so since we're we're a little bit worldwide here, we might want to be a little bit careful with the uh, uh, channel. We might be waking some people up. Um, I think those are really kind of the basics. Um, any anybody have any questions uh, on on Slack or things that you have um, things that you've discovered with the tool that you wanted to share? What about notifications? Is there a way to like get an email from Slack? If like, let's say I don't have Slack open on my desktop, um, is there a way to just get like a daily digest or something from Slack? Yeah, I think that is managed in our preferences. Uh, so, and, and just here real quick, let me show you where I got to that. So up at the top, clicking on my name, I can go into preferences. And, and then I've got the ability to manage how my notifications are are managed and controlled. So it's a whole section there related to notifications. So if you do want to be emailed, you can do that as well. Um, I tend to be in the app quite often, so uh, and it's on my phone, uh, my tablet. So I tend to see the messages one way or the other, but that's a great way for uh, to manage your notifications. Also, if you don't have your photo out uh, showing, you can simply click up at the top there and click on your photo, and it lets you um, add your add your picture in there if you'd like. 
And that is one thing I would like everybody to do is to please update a photo or upload a photo of yourself to your Slack profile. So Matt, can you show us, and you just did, <laughs> there's your yeah. profile yeah. and that's how you upload the photo. So that, that's one of your to-dos for the week is add a photo to Slack. Yep, so just click up here on the, on the workspace name and click on your um, avatar probably is what you have there now. And you can add your photo. You can also see there that I've added uh, some other information there. So my email address, phone number, and all of that's there as well. Uh, so that that is all visible uh, and available. If I'm in a meeting and I don't want to be disturbed, I do have the ability to set my status um, here to set status to in a meeting, um, on vacation, whatever happens to make sense there for you. But those are options as well. Other questions? All right, everybody is staying muted. So Natalia, do you want to take back the control? I will, yes. Um, go ahead and stop your presentation and I will start mine. All right. I was gonna say too, if anybody has questions, feel free to, to private message me or put it in the channel and I can, I'll do my best to try to assist. All right, and my presentation should be here if I can find the right window. There we go. Okay, so thank you, Terry, for that. Um, Terry's the Slack guy, so ask him if you have questions. So where are we? This is just a reminder of our seven-week plan. Today, we are going to talk about high-level integration capabilities and patterns. And um, I, I played emperor this week and asked all of you to do a little mini presentation on some aspect of integration tools for this week. So hopefully some of you have prepared that. If not, this is going to be a really awkward meeting. But we'll get through it either way. And so API overviews, this is kind of the presentation order. Um, I will start with just a brief overview of SOAP and REST, which are the underlying protocols that all these APIs use. And then um, this is this hopefully will match the assignments that went out this week. I know Prabhu is not here and Waruna is not here. Um, so we will have to pick up on that or hopefully somebody else can share on those as we get to them. When it's your turn to talk about the API, um, here is what we would like to know about that API. Whoops, we'll come back to that. And I'm going the wrong way, back up, back up. Okay, so that's the presentation order. Um, I will have that up on my screen. I'll let you know when you're up at bat, so to speak, but I'm gonna put myself up at bat first. And so a lot of these APIs say, well, they communicate over SOAP, they communicate over REST. Well, what the heck is SOAP and REST anyway? And what they are is they're a protocol for two systems to talk to each other over the internet. Um, at their very basic, that's what they are. And some high level differences between them. SOAP uses XML data. Um, it's been around a lot longer. It's very tightly formatted data. It has to be in a very specific order inside the XML file. It does use more bandwidth, but again, it also has more standards around it. And because Natalia? it's been, yes. Hey, we cannot see your screen. Oh, Didn't really? Go. Sorry about that. Let me, hmm. It tells me I'm sharing, but let me try again. Yeah, I was seeing that you're presenting too, but it doesn't, it's not showing. That's odd. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Let me get off this and try again. Present now a window. Soap versus rest. Share. Okay. It claims I'm presenting and I have a window telling me I'm presenting. So let me know when I'm actually presenting. Because <laughs> it, It's been around a little bit like it wanted to show it, but then it stopped for me again. Hmm. Anybody seeing the screen? No, I'm not. Even, same, same experience. It looked like it was trying to go and then back to just your name. Okay. The joy of live presentations. Let's try this one more time and I might just have to talk through this instead. So let me see. You know what? I will just share. If you want to send your presentation to me, I could share it if you'd prefer. I could do that. Let's try this one more time. And actually, I will send everybody a link to this presentation as well. So stand by. Let me know if that comes through. But in the meantime, yeah, let me get this sharing mode. 
Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it likes you just sharing the window because it looks like it is trying to look at whatever you're presenting, but it keeps going back to black. It's very odd because it's the same window I was presenting before, the same moto I was presenting before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, plan B, I'm going to exit out of presentation mode. Let me get you a shareable link. Um, and let me make it to everybody. Anyone with the link, save and copy. All right, and stand by. And here is the link to the presentation. Yeah, Terry, if you could try putting it that presentation in presentation mode and see if it'll work for you. And I'm going to stop presenting and hopefully Terry that'll let you present. Okay, it likes you better. <laughs> and it's slide eight. So as I was saying, um, SOAP versus REST. SOAP has been around longer. It uses a very structured data format called XML. We're going to deep dive into that, not this week, but next week. So it's coming. Don't worry, you'll get to play with XML. Very tight standards around messaging formats and error handling. Um, it, because of how large an XML file is, it does use a lot more bandwidth and it does operate slower. Um, but again, because it's been around so long, some legacy systems that might not be able to use REST can use SOAP. Best for system to system backend communication because there is it is a slower process. REST is kind of the new kid on the block, not so new anymore. Um, it can also use XML, but it can also use a format called JSON. And again, we'll get into JSON in the deep dive in a couple of weeks. There are no strict standards defined for REST like there are with SOAP. Um, the JSON file has can be very loosely formatted. And because the JSON files are much smaller, it it uses less bandwidth. Um, there's no standards around error handling. It's up to the developer to decide how errors get handled. And it is the newer protocol. Um, according to the article that I sourced for this slide, 70% of all new web services are being developed using the REST protocol. So that's a pretty hefty number. But that also tells you 30% are still using SOAP. So SOAP's not going anywhere anytime soon. It is faster and more lightweight. And if you're developing a mobile application or if you're developing a web application, then REST is the suggested way to go because it does go faster um, and it's more lightweight. Questions on SOAP or REST that I can hopefully attempt to answer? Or did I miss any important points about this that anybody else wants to add? I think there is an interesting comment to make about the Vistals well back when I was working with SOAP. Anytime you would add a new field, you would have to basically export a new Vistal so that your uh, web service could actually see the field. So I find it super annoying on my side, you know, working with that. <laughs> so that's the oldest side comment I'm going to make about that. OK, that's, that's a very good point. Yep. Anytime you take away a field, add a field, probably even yeah. if you rename the, if you give the field a new API name, you'll have to regenerate that wisdom. There you go. OK, thank you. And anybody else? Just wondering if there's any difference in, let's say, the size or the amount of data you can pass between SOAP and REST, uh, where they pretty much, the, the files can be large, so there's not really a limit either way. I don't know the answer to that. Anybody on the call know the answer to that? I think I read somewhere that uh, SOAP uh, is being used for smaller amounts of data. Now, we are not talking about bulk API at all, but in terms of like those SOAP versus REST, uh, I've seen the notion of using SOAP for smaller amounts but we don't necessarily know what those numbers are. About 50K-ish, I think it said in the article. Now I can't quote per se, but yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, that, that's homework for the group is find out what are the data limits around, around um, using SOAP or REST protocols, if there are any. Okay. Um, well, Svadka, how convenient that you're talking because you're up next talking oh, about well. chatter. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Terry, if you could go to the next slide. And again, for the API that I asked each of you to present, these are kind of the questions we wanted answered. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? Uh, what protocol does it use? What data formats does it use? What, how is it used? And are there other things that might be used in the same way? And I suppose this is a good time to talk about synchronous versus asynchronous. What does that even mean in case you don't know? Synchronous basically means that you go and you talk to the other system and you don't leave until the system gives you something back. Asynchronous says you send information to the system and either you don't care what the system does with it or you come back at some point later to see if the system did what you wanted it to do, or the system sends you a message at some point later saying, hey, I'm done. So the way I think about it is synchronous is you're sitting there, you're waiting around until you get some sort of reply back. Asynchronous, you either don't care or you'll come back later for the answer. And Nicole, looks like you posted a comment. Oh, good, SOAP API in contrast, optimized for real-time client applications that update a few records, okay. Okay, thank you. So SOAP API not as practical when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of records. So bulk APIs for that. And I believe bulk API uses the REST protocol. So Svadka, back to you. Well, one other quick thing I'll add on the synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, synchronous is wait, but if you're talking about Salesforce, Salesforce will only let you wait up to 120 seconds. Oh, good point. Those lovely governor limits that we all yes. love. <laughs> that will shut you off. And you can actually control that. You can make it less if you don't want to wait that long, but that is the maximum that you can wait. It'll shut off regardless of whether the other side ultimately sends you a message. You'll never get it. Okay. Very wonder, good point. This is Terry. I wonder, did, does anybody have a, a clever way of remembering which way is which? I, I, I understand the terms, but I get them backwards all the time. <laughs> Hmm. Any, any tricks that people have used for that, or am I just the only one that struggled with that? I, I just pounded it in. That <laughs> <which one>? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, for me, I think synchronous, and I think of like you know synchronizing your watches, and so so for me, it's like okay, well, I'm I'm synchronized with the other system, and the system and I are doing things kind of sort of at the same time. Okay. versus asynchronous, we didn't synchronize our watches, you know, the A meaning not. And so I do things on my schedule and the other system does things on its schedule. Okay. And I don't know if that helps or not, but. Very good. Okay, anything else on SOAP, REST, synchronous, asynchronous? All right, Svadka, you're really, really up. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you can see my screen. Um, right now, Terry's presenting. So Terry, maybe you need to stop so we can see Svadka's screen. There you go. Okay. Yes, we can see your screen. Beautiful. So I thought it would be interesting to just talk a little bit about chatter. So Chatter is a quick and effective communication within Salesforce. I remember when Salesforce came out with Chatter and the little Chatter mouse was running on a stage. Really <laughs> fun, fun mascot. And people weren't really quite taking into it. I also remember when uh, um, some of my customers, they would try to redact some words from Chatter. They would be like super terrified that people would post the wrong words. Uh, mm -hmm. on the message board. So they literally had a bank of words to try to redact the terrible terms that they were not supposed to use. Um, so, so that's the just fun fact about Chatter. And um, I actually have never used Chatter API, believe it or not. So Chatter REST API, uh, the benefits, uh, so integrates real time uh, synchronously with Chatter records, feeds, users, groups, uh, followers. It's REST-based, which is in the title, which is great to see. It's in the title there. And the format is JSON. Uh, it goes through HTTP and uh, XML. It says optionally. So I'm quite curious to know really why um, 
you know, the, the, the concept is there more optionally than anything. Uh, and if you were to understand or if you were to ask uh, Chat REST API, what does it look like? Uh, you would be looking at companies that have similar feeds like Facebook or Twitter. Um, in terms of ways to interact, so yes, it is real time synchronously, but then there are types within uh, chatters like photos that are being sent, maybe not real time per se. Uh, the authentication uh, um, is through OAuth 2.0, and the limits, instead of being org based like most of the limits that we typically know, they are set per user per application per hour. Now, it is in the documentation, it also states that. Um, the error message you're going to receive is 503, and it's up to us to make sure that we handle it uh, eloquently, uh, that we take care of the error messaging so it doesn't just show error messages on screens. So, so, so a big question here. So unlike most governor limits, which literally stop you in your tracks and are unrecoverable and give users ugly error messages, this one can be handled in code? That's what it says. Okay. That's right. It says, uh, make sure you handle this one in code. So uh, again, I haven't tried it. It would be interesting for us to try it out to see what we can do. Um, another interesting comment I found in documentation is trying to tell users what to do or what not to do and which uh, APIs are easier to use for certain purpose. And so in this case, it says, don't use Chatter REST API to extract data. There are better ways to do it, like REST or SOAP. So um, that's, that's not an interesting notion that I have found uh, in a documentation. Uh, now, time to actually use the theory into application. So where can we use Chat REST API? So it's, uh, you be, we could be looking at mobile apps, looking at uh, notifications to groups like uh, intranet or some other third party websites to try to notica notify users of events. I'm all of, all of a sudden thinking about the whole Slack channel that we were just chatting with Terry on. <laughs> um, so maybe we make our own uh, or we show us some chat messages on the Slack. I don't know. Let's, let's go make some interesting <laughs> use cases um, to confuse people here. And um, uh, I have, like I said, I have not used any of those in the past. So I'm wondering if anybody in a group has actually used Chatterest API and if you guys have another use case that you used it on. And it's quiet, so I am gonna take it <laughs> as a no. <laughs> and uh, so here is a, a last but not least differences between Chatter and other APIs. Um, this one is interesting. So when when you have something to show or uh, you're trying to render information on the web or mobile, uh, there is a way to render it in a in a better format, right? So I think that's what you're trying to say. Hey, JSON is probably better optimized for. Uh, for uh, viewing on a web or mobile. Um, the data that is being returned is localized to the user's time zone. Uh, the changed values are tracked in value pair and uh, the same that limits that we just chatted about. It's not organizational based, but it is per user, per application, per hour. And I'm wondering if this comes along with sort of like the licensing model, depending on how many users you have. Um, maybe you get more limits. And I'm just assuming here and making a speculation. So not quite familiar exactly how Salesforce chooses what the limits are. Hmm. And I'm and I'm thinking, I'm wondering if this limit is intended to basically keep somebody from trying to spam the system, like Very one true. user going rogue and deciding yep. to blow up everybody's chatter feed. Yep. That makes sense. Thank you, Swatka. Uh, Swati, user interface. I think Swati was having troubles getting kicked off. So Swati is not here. Uh, Prabhu also not here. Uh, a tool. Tell us about Bulk API. Sure, guys. So let me start presenting my screen. OK. Let me know when you can see it. Not getting a presentation notification. Oh, oh, here it comes. There we go. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, so it's about the bulk API. It's going to be short and sweet. Uh, there's not much to it, uh, frankly. So yeah, let's start with the basic questions here. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? Uh, it's 
definitely my bad asynchronous what protocol rest api uh, it's based on basic rest api again guys uh, just to point out here there's a new bulk api that has come out it's a, that's called bulk api 2.0 uh, it's uh, it's a little different uh, from uh, the bulk api that was earlier that is bulk api 1.0 so what i've gone ahead is i've i've prepared this presentation as per 2.0 right because i'm i'm assuming that's what we are going to be using uh going forward right and 1.0 is it's kind of become obsolete now so uh rest api so we are going to go ahead and check what are the uh, differences between 1.0 and 2.0 uh in this presentation as well it's based on rest api data formats it uses csv files because again uh the whole point of bulk api is uploading the data uh what is it used for it's used to insert update or delete large amounts of data in salesforce uh now you would ask um we can do that with other apis as well right but yeah i'll tell you exactly what's the problem with other apis and why bulk api so is there any other api yes bulk api 1.0 uh, can be used to do similar kind of thing and then you can you can use the rest api and soap api as well to uh kind of create update and delete data in salesforce so yeah so to give you an idea this is a successor to the bulk api 1.0 uh this supports oauth 2.0 the bulk api 1.0 didn't support it this format uh to log in but yeah bulk api 2.0 it uh supports oauth uh, it supports REST API. Just to give you an idea, Bulk API 1.0 didn't use the standard REST API format that is followed in Salesforce. It, it had a, you know, weird custom REST API implementation of its own uh, that, that had to be followed. Uh, it supports automatic automatic file batching. So that means, so earlier you have to, you know, create your own batches you have to divide the whole file so if you have to uh, upload let's say millions of records you have to divide it in uh, different batches and then upload it but this but with 2.0 you don't need to do that you just need to have all your data in one file and just upload it don't think about it and it's going to take care of the batching on its own now to give you a context here why exactly bulk api is being used so you can upload up to 100 million records in 24 hours Yes, that's a lot of records that you can take care of. Uh, for, for a little bit of context, Data Import Wizard only supports 50,000 records and Data Loader only supports 5 million records, right? So in the end, we, uh, if you have to upload more than that, then bulk API is the way to go about it. Question on the 24 hour period, is that a rolling 24 hours? Or if I started loading at 8 a.m., do I get another 100 million records that I can load at 8 a.m. the next day? or is it within any 24 hour block, I only get a hundred million record limit? Now, frankly, I've not been able to check that, Natalia. So I'm not being, I'll not be able to comment on that, but yeah, I think it's gonna be like uh, in the 24 hours, hundred million. Yeah, I, let, let me check that. Okay. I, I know with, the, and maybe it was this, or maybe it was just bulk API 1.0. I thought it was a rolling window, but I don't quite remember either. Correct. Now, guys, uh, Bulk API 2.0 only supports create, update, and deleting of records. You cannot query the records. Uh, that again, query was something that is uh, that is supported in Bulk API 2.0 uh, 1.0, but query is something that's still it's still not supported with 2.0. Now, you can definitely uh, safely assume that there's gonna be 3.0 and 4.0 as well because i was going through a couple of presentations and, and uh you know the product managers and the team who developed this api and they were mentioning that they are in the process of optimizing this api further right so internally they have not optimized it they have just made it a lot easier for for us to use it but they definitely want to go ahead and do that so there's a lot of changes that are gonna uh, again safe harbor so uh, Salesforce creates, uh, so yeah, internally. So like I said, you know, it automatically creates batch batches, right? So th the whole point is internally, it creates 10,000, a batch of 10,000 records, right? So you don't have to create uh, batches on your own and then upload one batch at a time. It's going to internally take care of it, depending on uh, the availability of the resources or the availability of the computing power. Uh, the maximum csv file size that you can work with is 150 mb 
Uh, I'm a little confused here because there are a couple of places where they were mentioning 125 MB and then in the documentation is 150 MB. So I'm going to go with the documentation. It's 150. So to give you an idea, uh, a basic comparison here, like I said, uh, Bulk API version 1 used to support create, update, delete, and query. Bulk API to, uh, version 2 only supports create, update, and delete. Uh, you have you had to create batches, no concept of batches. You can just go ahead and upload the file right away. It was built on its own REST framework. So there was you know certain um, certain URL, certain commands that you have to use that were very specific to bulk API. But uh, you can now use you know basic REST framework, standard REST framework. So you can you can actually use bulk API with Workbench now. Uh, so there was metering based on number of batches. So there were there were like how many batches you can run, how many records you can upload. All of those kind of limits were there. Multiple different limits. Now it has been simplified. It's just a limit on the basis of number of rows that can be processed, and that is hundred million records in twenty four hours. So it's uh, bulk API one one supports serial and parallel processing. Two only supports parallel processing. Now the team did say that they are they will be going ahead and including the serial processing as well here but yeah that's that's still on the road so guys this is uh, all about 2.0 from my end I, any questions anything that i can help you with so that last slide especially this part about um serial versus parallel processing this sounds like the kind of thing that that knowing that information would somehow be useful on an exam because where they would ask something like, you know, they need to load records serially. Which of these APIs should be used? And they're going to give you bulk API <laughs> one v one and bulk API v two as the question choices. <laughs> right, and uh, Natalia, here I'm a little confused exactly. So, uh, so we have got version two and we've got version one. Uh, I'm a little afraid that uh, we might get end up getting questions around bulk api and again in the in the exam it's not going to be exactly mentioned whether it's version one or version two and we end up answering incorrectly so what do you say how should we address that that's a good question i haven't looked at the study guide to see if it specifically mentions api 1.0 versus 2.0 i know one of the other designer oh, yes. exams specifically did um, point study out guide, yeah. to know the You're differences. Right. Uh -huh. So I would check that. I think it was data architecture. They they specifically said know the differences between API 1.0 and 2.0. The bulk API, right? Yeah. So oh. are, they, are they talking about retiring the bulk API V1 or is it? No, no. Version one is still there, out there, uh, pretty much alive. You can <clears> still <throat> use it. But yeah, uh, again, for example, if you have a use case where you need to query the records, then bulk API version one is the way to go about it. And then uh, there are a lot of tools that are built on version one, right? Uh, that again, version one, the way it is implemented, it's a, it's a custom REST framework. So those tools are built specifically for that. If they are going to just retire bulk API, or just they cannot just shut it off. Those tools are going to stop working. So I don't think they have any plans of retiring it for now. Yeah. And because Salesforce says everything is always going to be backwards compatible, right. I, I don't see right. the right. off. Um, but but or at the very least, until API 2.0 can do everything 1.0 can do, spe specifically the query and the serial processing, and then like a tool mentioned, all these tools are used to calling one p version one because of the REST framework, and if they suddenly turn that off, you've just broken a lot of integration points. Well, right. and especially on this one, that serial processing is the big issue because if you're if what you're loading ends up doing a lot of record locks because of local. <laughs> You've got to switch it to serial to make sure the thing Oh, yes. You have to be like, you can only go, you know, one object at a time. Right. And that definitely is not, that's definitely going to slow down the whole thing. So, yeah, they, they, they said they are, they're working on it. Serial is definitely going to come. So, like I said, you know, version three, version four are definitely going to be there. Very good. Thanks. All right, guys. Any questions? That's it. Great. Has anybody used bulk API from any real use cases? Not real, but uh, I kind of got my hands dirty with it a little bit. And it's it's pretty fairly easy to use. It's pretty fun. And again, uh, like Natalia mentioned, uh, it, it's definitely hard to get 
your hands on to a hundred a file that has hundred million records, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, I'm actually working on it. So, I found uh, uh, I found some code on GitHub uh, that is open source, and I might end up uh, uh, deploying it to one of my servers, and I might give you access to that. So that what that code does is it generates dummy data for you. Oh, cool. So just stand by, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, because later on in the study plan, um, there is a deep dive into the bulk API and data loading. And yeah, I've also been thinking about, is there some way to get a bunch of data that we could practice actually loading a file with more than 10,000 records in it? Sure, but with because uh, you know, whatever the tools that we have got on the market, they are pretty limited. Uh, either they are paid, right? Or they limit you to 100 or 1,000 records of dummy data at a time. Right. So that's going to become a difficult situation. So I'm just hoping to deploy it on my own org and kind of give you the, give this whole group the access to it for free. And maybe, you know, later on, uh, start charging for it. There you go. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why maybe not? something as simple as you create a for loop that generates a 1,000 lines into a CSV file, and we just use that. <laughs> right. Right. Again, it's all always going to be free for the integration architecture group, guys. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. One of the benefits of joining a group like this. <laughs> right. Anybody else? Yeah, there is something to be said for this bulk API. Like for data migrations, it's, uh, it's a lifesaver. I, I used to do data migrations a long time back. It was pre-bulk API, and we would literally sit for 12 hours to wait to load 12, or, you know, like 1.2 million rows. So when bulk API showed up, it's definitely a lifesaver. But the pros and cons between just doing data loads with data loader versus turning it to you know that little checkbox for bulk API is that you do not see the error messages for those data loads till after it's finished. So imagine you have an error throughout your file, and it errors are halfway through. You actually have no idea that you just loaded like maybe 30% of your file onto the org. And then the next, you can't just do insert, you got to do upsert so that you don't continuously load. And so depending on what you're trying to data load, that bulk API, if it breaks, you got to remember to back everything out, delete and start over because it probably did pass you know, a certain amount of success into the org, but it's not going to show it to you in the success error files. So that's the only sort of drawback on that. Right, but uh, you know, Swatka here, version two, uh, it does provide you an access to the error files. So okay. in version, yeah. right, version one, it it was like one file with the rows, success error, success error. You have to go and figure it out, right? But in version two, they give you separate files. So success files, a success file is going to be separate, and then error, the records, records that have errored out, the you can you can actually extract a separate file for that. Yeah, so with the version version one, I suppose I haven't tried the version two yet. But what happens is it would start generating those success and error files at the end in ter in case it actually finished. But let's say you did end the file halfway through your file for some odd reason, it would not create the success and error at all. You know what I'm saying? Like it just like errored out on us. Ooh. So <laughs> yeah, which is a lot of fun if you don't have any clues what happened, right? And uh, Half of your data is actually now in an org, so yeah, a lot of fun. Right, and 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 uh, so, uh, sorry, I, I think you're talking about something else, and I kind of answered something else. Just to add one last point here, uh, you know, it's it's kind of the same issue with version two as well. So what what it does is it waits out for a particular batch to run uh, for ten minutes uh, or maybe ten sorry ten seconds, and then it it retries it. So the total number of retries it's going to do is 10. And after that, it's just going to fail out. And then uh, that 10,000, so like I said, internally, it, it runs in a 10,000 batch. So that 10,000 batch is going to be aborted or it's going to be marked as a status failed. And then the next batch is, is going to start running. So I guess, you know, in that way, you know, it's going to be a little slow in this case as well, because again, it's going to retry that batch again and again if it's erroring out or there's some other issue but yeah at one point it's going to just keep it aside and move on to the next batch okay thank you well, there you go i love it when people that have actually done this stuff come on and talk about this is what it looks like in real life versus this is how trailhead says it works in a perfect world <laughs> so all right um let's see who is up next nicole Hi. 
Hi there. Tell Hi. us about the metadata API. All right. So I kept this very high level. And let me know if you can see my screen. I'll let yep. it sit for you a second. Okay. All right. Um, so the metadata API is used to retrieve, deploy, create, update, or delete customizations um, for your Salesforce org. Um, you use this when you want to migrate changes from a sandbox org to a testing org or a production environment, or in some use cases um, to a developer org or like an org in which you're merging multiple orgs together. Um, it is asynchronous. It uses um, the SOAP protocol and the data format is XML. Uh, the other API that you can kind of use in its place in some use cases, um, which uh, thank you Atul for posting that really big chart. <laughs> um, there's a lot there, but you can use the tooling API. And from my understanding, like the tooling API is a better um, option when you're trying to integrate Salesforce metadata with other systems that are not necessarily Salesforce. Um, and you can use it to um, manage Apex classes and triggers and test cases and, uh, or test classes, sorry, and visual force pages and stuff that's a little bit more developer heavy um, and allows you to check code coverage and things like that, like you would see within like the developer console. So um, what I really kind of use to kind of help me get a really easy basic overview of um, the different APIs is just the Trailhead API basics, get to know the Salesforce APIs, um, because it's really simple um, and it doesn't give you too much information at once if this isn't your language, which it definitely is not necessarily mine. I feel like I talk it and I don't know what I'm talking about. So I went here um, and then the other uh, one was the one that was noted in the Slack channel. Um, if it'll let me click on it, which is the Stack Exchange um, conversation that was that Natalia um, posted, which was when do you use which one? Yep. So, but from um, a tool's comment, like with his big chart that he showed us, it seems like you can't always say the tooling API is the better API and it has more functions because it seemed like there were a couple things that the metadata API had that the tooling API didn't. So it's like, you really have to just look at the details and see which one's gonna fit your job better. Yeah, and I've had the the privilege or the pleasure or the displeasure of using the metadata API in various ways. Um, you know, obviously pushing change sets, uh, yeah. use a tool called GearSet, and they make heavy use of the metadata API to move data. Uh -huh. And then also just using Workbench to do retrieves and deploys of data. And um, it's, it's sometimes an exercise in frustration trying to deploy to another org and like it dies the first time it hits an error. And then you just have to go and fix that error. And then you get a little farther and it dies again because there's another error in the deployment. And it's kind of frustrating, but it's also kind of cool because you see the underlying structure of how all that data is stored in Salesforce. So it's pretty nifty. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of if you're just using standard change sets within Salesforce, how painful that is. And when you're trying to deploy customizations and things of that nature from a sandbox environment to a production org, you know, you can fix one error and then cause a whole bunch and you don't know until you get that magic little fish that says, oh, sorry. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, that's what we call fishing out. It, like where it's like, oh, it's going to fish out on us. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the dreaded waiting for the validation to finish. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're right. There are some really, um, very particular nuances with making sure metadata can be pushed correctly through an API. Um, and I've used a couple other tools. I think one of, some of the tools that they mentioned were um, the um, force.com IDE Eclipse and then um, the uh, force.com uh, or the ant migration tool, which I probably could have added another slide here. I was trying to stay super high level. Um, it does bring them up. I want my ant migration tool. There we go. So um, they did mention that 
you can use the metadata API through force.com IDE or the ant migration tool. Um, and I have not gotten the ant migration tool set up correctly on my computer. And I feel like every time I set up force.com IDE, I never want to use it. So the only time I really get into these is when someone has an apex class that I need to delete <laughs> because it's doing something it shouldn't be doing. And I feel like that's really the only time I've, I've used those though. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Or to find where this magic field exists that I can't delete for some reason. I will search all of my metadata to get rid of stuff that I don't think is necessary. So, uh, so guys, now that we are on this topic, so you rightly mentioned uh, the chain set and metadata API. Uh, I've used Ant, I've used Force.com ID. It's a problem with both that uh, if there's an error, you're going to get it one error at a time. So you get one error, fix it, then you again do that, again deploy, uh, again another error. And so again, it's definitely going to be very helpful if we get all these errors in like one go. So have you used any tool or any API or anything that does that? Because I think uh, we are at the mercy of chain sets or metadata API right now to get any and every deployment done. You know? Right. So, so just to answer that tool, that question directly, we switched to where we're doing all of our deploys um, through source management, through a source code management tool. Right. So we tracked all the metadata out, all the classes, triggers, um, all that stuff, and it's all stored within Git. And then we, with every check into Git, we have a test machine that kicks off a build. So we know right away if somebody just put in a... Um, class that's referencing an object that they forgot to update the field. So we're doing that without waiting like three days, four days, waiting two weeks to try and push stuff up and get those errors one at a time. We're getting them every time somebody checks something in um, to kind of write there and then and the message goes out so they can go and check right away. So that, that's one way to do it is to, mm -hmm. you know, to do it more often so you don't have as many changes in um, and you catch things right away. That's also a very good way to start to learn all this, all this uh, say the AI stuff. When you mentioned about doing searches, because we extract everything out, everybody has a copy of all the metadata. So if you want to find a field, you want to across all of your objects, workflows, whatever else, it is very quick within that metadata to find out where is something getting used, how is it getting used. Um, so it becomes a very good search tool that uh, sometimes you don't have directly within the org. Yeah, and there is also in summer 18 release notes, there is something called metadata component dependency that I just put in a chat as a link. So I think that's going to, I think it's still in the pilot mode, so it's not ready per se, but it's going to start helping us to, to, to make sure that we group together all of the different pieces such as, hey, I want to delete a field. I really don't know where it's uh, where it's connected to. You can literally put it in there. And I, I think I've seen demos at Trailhead uh, DX where in um, in a CLI command line, they would run demos and uh, queries and they would actually list all of the files where this particular field is part of. So I think we could use a couple of different ways, not just to deprecate, but also to combine. Uh, to make sure that your deployments have all of the pieces. Uh, I just ran a deployment last uh, Monday and I was coming to an org that didn't have lots of stuff enabled. All of the changes that failed with like a system error with absolutely no clues. Uh, so I went back to end and I suffered through my end deployment yet again, but I found all of my clues in end deployments. It, it gives you a lot more information in terms of, hey, go and turn on and enable this feature. And hey, maybe they didn't enable lightning knowledge and you're tying it into your service console. So those kind of things like dependencies that don't come across from an API, they you have to that they are assumed that you have already enabled in an environment uh those kind of clues you're gonna get in end better than you would get in like uh change sets in other places wow that that almost entices me to try installing the ant tool and play with it <laughs> i'll be happy to show it to you i i think that's the reason i don't i don't work with some of these tools is just i open it and i just freak out because it's something i don't know and i'm like oh i just i just need somebody to hold my hand through this and then i'll be fine <laughs> i'll hold your hand oh well, thank you <laughs> virtually <laughs> so jeff i just wanted to ask you uh you talked about uh, you know getting the build run every time you uh push the code into github uh what exactly what tool are you using to do that to run the build and everything my rci tool is auto rabbit right got it 
Got it. That okay. Yeah, it was kind of a, we had started out with Jenkins, which worked, but Jenkins is kind of for building everything from C to Java to C plus plus, and also with the Salesforce stuff, Auto Rabbit built tools around nothing more than doing stuff with, you know, within uh, Salesforce. So the the tools are much more focused on understanding that metadata and understanding the things there. So I mean, we're pretty happy with it. There, there's there's issues with it, but um, you know, there are a lot of a lot of good things as well. Got it. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions? All right, Surabi, you are up with the streaming API. <laughs> OK. Uh, let me see if I can start sharing. Yeah, we can see your screen. OK. So with streaming API, it's almost like a radar-like behavior where we don't have to go and query to find out what are the data changes that are happening in Salesforce. In fact, but when, a, when the data changes, we can define events and push notification to your external apps whenever uh, any changes are happening. So basically, they don't have to keep a lookout for any data changes. You don't have to constantly poll Salesforce and make unnecessary API request. So that's pretty neat. I had my first diagram, which I didn't understand much, but the radar definitely made much more sense to me that it's, it is automatically you know, giving us these events and which uh, we can kind of uh, query to find out if there are data changes happening. So, and this is near real time notifications uh, that we actually get. So is it asynchronous or synchronous? And I definitely struggled this one with this one because there was no direct documentation on how do I want to categorize it. And please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm still categorizing this as asynchronous because truly it's just, you know, putting these events out there. It doesn't really care if somebody's catching the ball on the other side. So right. I, I think with, with that with the pub sub, I think that automatically becomes async because you synchronously send the message out, but somebody could come come and get it at any time in the future. So you're not waiting around to see if somebody answered. You just send it out there and then you're done. So Okay, I'm happy that this one I got this one right. <laughs> Uh, so the next one was like, what, which protocol does it uses? And I don't know how to say this word, but this was the protocol it talked about. And it has the Comet e messaging library. So it's definitely different. I'm also used to, I've done the REST API and SOAP API in the past, but uh, I'm not sure about this protocol at all. So yeah. what? I don't really know what it does, but I think it's pronounced by you, just by like you. The, the area of Louisiana. Okay. That was easy. Okay, by you, that's easy. So what data format it does use, uh, uses, we can create, uh, you know, Apex Web Services to do uh, similar things. So we can use REST and SOAP both. Uh, this, the next question was actually, again, I think, where can it be used? And I just mentioned about how we can define events and put notifications to any external app uh, that we want notified of. And the last question was, is there any other API that does the same thing? I don't think so. I thought Chatter API might do similar from a messaging perspective, but not really, because I think uh, the Chatter API is truly just you know, posting messages. It's not really talking about any data changes that is happening. Uh, so and, or when I say data changes, it can be any of the, like they have the, some of the standard objects that are defined, typical contacts, accounts, opportunities, and all the custom objects are supported as well. So um, to, give, to give an example. You go, sorry, sorry Surabi, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh -huh. So um, as far as like, how does it push messages out? Is it using like JSON or is it using XML or is it using something completely different? to publish its data? 
uh, it actually is, it says JavaScript, and I am I I started looking into the details of it, and I have the trailhead, which I'm still going through. This one is the big one, actually. But uh, okay, I think looking at that, yeah, that, that looks so uh, Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it does look does JSON. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it basically we'll we'll create queries, and there's this push topic object, so we kind of query the we use a query to find out which what we want to create the event of, and then we will create this push object uh, push topic s object, and that we uh, that is what we would be doing the streaming of. Cool. So. All right, I think you had one more slide to go. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the last thing was like, where can it be used? There was this one problem statement where Richard talked about like when an event occurs, and if you don't want to refresh your Salesforce instance, which I've heard often about, why do I have to keep refreshing? So uh, if we are using the streaming API, then you don't really have to refresh to check the data changes. It will automatically uh, uh, push it on the page layout. Okay, nice and, and concise. Sorry, yeah, and there, I was going to say, and there are multiple. Like, I mean, I can think think about multiple examples from this for mobile pieces. Like, it's the typical subscribe piece, right? Like, if you are doing push notifications, and if somebody subscribed to it, so any data changes that are happening, or any other external app that needs to do something, whenever an opportunity gets converted, or something like that, it can be used uh, in multiple ways. Personally, I've never used it. So definitely, let us let me know if you have used it. Has anybody else used it? I have not, but it kind of reminds me the whole heartbeat concept that it used to be probably predates streaming API, where you would have a program running and just trying to tap into Salesforce and see anything changed, anything changed, like every so often, you know. Like trying to see, so I think I think the reaction to those types of patterning came into streaming API, where they were like, "Hey, we'll just tickle you. We'll let you know when something changed, so that you can go and make a proper call into Salesforce and grab your changes." I, so th that's how I look at streaming API. I have not used it per se. Yeah, okay. that's a beautiful way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I mean, I've. Uh, one example I would say that in the past I have worked with, uh, if somebody is familiar with the Rally uh, application, so it's it's very similar to Jira, it's like a ticketing system. And uh, in the past we had to integrate between Salesforce and Rally, and Rally was more like a polling system, which is a pain sometimes because you have to constantly poll an external system to find out if anything has changed and constantly compare. So that's where like the Salesforce streaming API uh was one of the like nicer things when we were comparing between two external systems that which would be better for integration we never really did the integration but that was just comparisons on where it can be helpful all right very good thank you surabi uh waruna is not present uh, but nicole did manage did mention the tooling api in her presentation so thank you nicole and jeff that leaves you to talk about apex all right, let me get switched over here. Everybody see what I've got? I'm not seeing it yet, but I'm sure it'll be coming. Yeah, not seeing anything, and it's not saying yeah. it's anything either. Jeff. Yeah, I'm not seeing any notices come through. Oh, oh, there it goes. I think it is now, yeah. Had to kickstart it a little. All right, so, so essentially Salesforce, you know, APIs give us programmatic access to the information and allow you to do some uh, custom functionality, essentially a key component of which is, is the Apex language. So in terms of specifically doing integrations and so forth, we can set up outbound REST and SOAP connections to other systems through Apex. 
Uh, so we've kind of talked about those little pieces separately. But let's say we wanted to connect outbound to somebody, then um, you can go in and write some Apex code that'll make those underlying REST or SOAP connections, either one, depending on what the other system needs. And then coming back into the system, we talked about the, the REST and the SOAP API to directly access things, but we can also set up web services through um, Apex that kind of more control how somebody comes in. So if you let them come in through REST, and get to your account ID, then they might have access to all the fields. But let's say we wanted to just instead give them the ability to create a record of which we needed to update fields maybe in three or four different objects, rather than make, making them figure out what all the different commands and controls would be to get to those, those three different objects, we could set up a web service that exposed, um, create this record, I need these five fields, and what you're gonna get back is that. And then through the Apex code, we can control where those different things um, end up getting uh, getting saved out. If in if later on we had to change what one of those objects were and put it to something else, we could keep from breaking everybody else by having that same footprint. We just go in and change the code that says instead of putting this field in object A or even in field A, we move it over to field B. So we can kind of hide some of our stuff we're doing by by putting up those uh, the, those Apex web services in front of let's say making a direct call into um, the Salesforce. Um, there's numerous authentications around this. In fact, there's a whole nother cert, you know, dealing with uh, um, authorization or identity management that deals with the nine or 10 different flows that come in. Primary mechanism for connection is either OAuth 10A, uh, which is an older spec, that's a little bit more secure, so some people still require that then OAuth 2.0, but there's a number of different things through certificates, um, different ways of connecting, um, whether you've got a, you know, whether you're doing two servers where you can protect particular things or whether you're um, connect, let's say a device, a phone device or something else where you don't have as much security, there's different ways where you can set up that, that authentication basically to connect to uh, both in and out with these web services. Um, they're both synchronous and asynchronous. You have controls over that. so. Within your code, you can make a direct call out, um, uh, which ends up being a synchronous call, and you can wait around for that data to come, that answer to come back in, uh, you know, in order to process. Then you can take that exact same code that's that's making that call out, and you put it within a batch. You make that uh, piece batch interface or uh, the future um, attribute on that particular method, and then you can, although that little piece is waiting for it to come come back to get the answer, the entire process is not waiting. Um, you know, it's running at a, at a time in the future. That little piece will wait for it, but in terms of what you're you're seeing, you just click the button, you're back to working in the background that goes off and works. So in, in that method, it becomes asynchronous, uh, kind of through the access, accessing the same code you've written, depending on um, what you wrap around that through the Apex code. Um, like I said, we, we've already kind of talked uh, protocols dealing with uh, REST and SOAP. Um, but as we get down a little further into some of those items, there's data formats is um, with REST, you've got JSON, XML, and then you can connect either through um, HTTP or HTTPS, which adds additional security. On, uh, Jeff, come back to your microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, <laughs> I'm using my home PC, and I guess the mic must be located Oh, you, st you, you stepped away again. <laughs> so, so the data formats, REST, um, JSON, um, XML, um, HTTP, or PS uh, for the security, SOAP uh, through XML. And we've kind of talked about that through, actually, when we talk about the REST API and whatever else, this is, this is similar to using those same things. Um, what, would, let's, what are other ways of doing this if we didn't, uh, let's say, use Apex? So there are outbound messages that we can connect um, through SOAP to other uh, systems as, let's say, part of workflow. So there's no um, code that's associated with that. We can, it's through some configuration that we can make, make those outbound SOAP calls, but it's pretty limited in what you can do there. You know, there's no ability to go in and, and change what you need to. You kind of uh, find what the fields are, what you want to push across. I think, it, I think it's limited to one object um, to select those fields to put across, but you can essentially get that, that same mechanism done. And kind of as I indicated, although REST and SOAP, you can directly connect into Salesforce, 
You can also write um, Apex around creating your own web service in order to hide those, um, uh, the mechanisms of how that's getting done and expose exactly how you want those connections to come in. Any questions or other thoughts uh, around the Apex? Um, not not questions, just thoughts, but a lot of these APIs we talked about, like the metadata API, the streaming API, the chatter API, those can all be accessed directly in Apex without having to make callouts, which is pretty cool. Um, right. This kind of allows you to program to many of those other things we talked about, so. Yeah, and maybe on the back end it is doing rest or soap, I don't know, but all I know is I, I just need a namespace and a class name and I'm rolling and off and rolling using <laughs> Apex. I have a question for you, Jeff. So let's say that I create a record in Salesforce. I make a service call out um, to a downstream system. You said you can wait for it to bring you maybe like an idea or success. How long can you wait? Is there a limit? Like imagine that the downstream system goes to system, 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 and it has to return back. Um, is, is there like a 120 second limit? Right, that, that, that's what we kind of talked about before. When you make an outbound call, um, you can figure in that call how long you want to make. If, if you don't want to wait two, two minutes, you can set it to ten, 10 seconds saying, I want a response back or not. But the maximum you can wait would be two minutes. Yeah. It, it will sit there and hopefully everything you're doing downstreams um, will end up coming back or you, you have to switch the method. If you're not getting things back within two minutes and you've got to switch back to a where you call out and it gets done, then you have to go back and query that system later on to see if it actually got done. Where, where there's actually a situation we've got now where we may switch over to that model because we find cases where we're not getting responses back within two minutes. Right. We have to switch the entire mode, but that is the most. This, and we've talked to them, and that's not a configurable thing. That's a, that's a hard limit. Yeah, so I was just thinking I have the same use case uh, currently where I'm thinking I'm going to use the middleware to come back and give me the update. Um, but, so, so there's a yeah. couple different ways that you can end up doing that. You can either make the call out and then you come back at some time in the future where you think it should always be done and make a call back out to see if the records got created, if you've got that same type of API. The other way to do it is to have the systems call each other. So you make a call out that you want something. When the other system gets done, they make a call back into you and pass you that ID, of which you can then catch that in it through a different uh, method. You could set up a web service for them to call back into. Uh, they call and say, okay, I've created this new record, here's the ID, you can then take that and update on your record. So it's two different ways you can kind of accomplish the same thing there. Yeah, good deal. Thank you. Anybody else on Apex questions? Okay, thank you, Jeff. I'm gonna try to share my screen again and see if it works. And if it doesn't, then I'm gonna go cry in a corner somewhere. Um, let's see, this is the one I thought I was sharing. So let's try this again. Present a window. I want to present this window. It claims I'm presenting my screen. Does anybody have any evidence of me presenting my screen? Nope, it tried, but it went right back to. Yeah. Oh, sad. Okay, well, Terry, could you could you be my uh, slide driver, please? <laughs> <laughs> or Jeff, if you're still, if somebody could just bring that that uh, Google slide back up, please. I will stop presenting because apparently I can't present. Okay, I've, I've got the slide back up so I can. All right, thanks. Presenting, I think so. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Okay, and then we are actually down on slide 11. Oh, actually, sorry, slide 10. And did you jump to slide 10 and my screen is just frozen? Okay, 
there it's moving okay so so we those are all the integration yeah, options I... we talked about <clears throat> and in some of the other documentation that was on the reading list this week there are all these other options as well which aren't nearly as complex but probably good to know what all these things do um, outbound messaging that was already covered briefly um, email you know as far as sending out emails i guess that's considered an integration because you're sending something somewhere else salesforce to salesforce salesforce connect mashups and canvas which are very close basically ways to embed one application inside another application um, if you're developing specifically for mobile and you want to use the hardware of an android phone or an apple phone there's a mobile sdk available that lets you do that um, a lot of you are probably using some sort of desktop integration for your email and does anybody have Chatter Desktop on their computers? Well, they just, they just uh, this release uh, dropped it. So if you did have it, you don't know. Oh, OK, then. Well, we'll take that off the list. I thought it was going away. Yeah, it, this release was, uh, it's not out there anymore. OK, well, good. All right, and then any app exchange tools that maybe do the integration for you, such as MuleSoft, which is, I don't know if it's still going to be considered an app exchange tool now that Salesforce owns it. but. That's one of the big integrating um, companies in the field. Data Loader, everybody's favorite tool for loading and extracting data. And CTI, Computer Telephony, they actually list this as an integration as well. And apparently there's two different ways to do that. So bump these against the study guide. And if any of these look like things you should know more about, this is just a uh, suggestion to go and learn more. And if we go to slide 11, please. Fun with flashcards. And Terry put a bunch of flashcards out there today. So thank you, Terry. And put a bunch of mock exam questions out there as well. And some other folks added some questions also. So these are just some of the flashcards out of the um, Google Sheet. Just a reminder, please go out there as you're thinking of things and studying things. If you're creating flashcards for yourself, share the love with the rest of us, please. Quick so question on, quick question on how to get to that doc to add them. Um, when I go out to, and I use Google Drive a lot, when I go out to look at what's been shared, all I really see is the video from huh. a session. So how, did you share the actual? Um, yeah, it's in a folder one up above where the video is. Okay. So if you go to your Google Drive and click on shared with me, hopefully you will see it there. Yeah, that's where I've been looking and all I actually see is the. Okay, what's that second tab you have up? Is that is the one of your personal? Yeah. Yeah, that's it right there. That's the sheet. So, you're... so yeah, Terry's able to get there. Um... Oh, that's Terry driving. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I lost track of who had it. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'm not sure how to navigate through the different folders, but if you click that those three bars up there, that's what I did up there in the uh, upper left, and then. There's like a shared with me, what I'm used to seeing. Yeah, when you go to Google Drive, there's a shared with me option. Right, and all that shows up there is the video. Okay, it may be that I forgot okay. to add you. So okay. you all should have edit access on this Google Sheet that Terry's showing right now. Um, and you should have read access to the study guide, the study guide or the, the weekly reading list. But this spreadsheet should be viewable to you. Okay. And you should be able to add things to it. One one question that I had was on the column. I think both of them have a review by. Yeah. How, how are you wanting us to leverage that or use that? Um, just if you looked at it and if you agree that it's free of errors, just put your name there. Just that way we know that there was another set of eyeballs on it and somebody, somebody else said, yeah, this is right. Okay. Just a little sanity testing if, if you feel so inclined. Perfect. Um, so yeah, Terry, if we go back to that slide, uh, this one. yeah, that one. Okay. So true or false apex code ignores profile based security restrictions and profile based security restrictions mean, do you have access to certain objects in certain fields? So does apex code ignore those restrictions? It depends. You can make, ignore it and you can make it utilize them. I disagree with that. I think you're talking about record sharing, where you can, where Apex code can see all records, um, or you can turn on with sharing, and then it will only right. allow you to see what the user sees. But I'm talking specifically about whether a user can access a certain object or a certain field oh. on an object. Okay. 
Yeah, the key word there being the profile base. I think that's true. And who said that? I didn't catch who was talking. This is sort of me. Yeah. I would agree with you. It is true because Apex always needs to have access to everything. Um, however, while Apex does ignore um, profile restrictions, there are methods available for you to check whether the user has access to certain fields. And you can write code in to prevent them from seeing things they shouldn't be seeing. But by default, Apex sees all objects, all fields. And, and that's why you use methods like is editable, is updatable, or all that, right? Right. Yes, that's, that's exactly that. what they're for. OK, perfect. Yep, and if you're studying for the sharing and visibility exam, that will come up on the exam. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, what API besides user interface can be used to build user interfaces in some situations? Nobody. Svatka should be able to answer this one. Yeah, maybe it's the <laughs> metadata API, right? Because then you know the configuration pieces. Actually, the Salesforce documentation said that it's the chatter API. And what they said was, if you're building something where people are posting messages or posting reviews, that you would want to use the chatter API rather than the user interface API to build that out. Interesting. Yeah. All right, and what's the preferred API protocol if you're developing mobile or web apps? REST. Yay! <laughs> I wish I had like, you know, snacks to throw at people <laughs> when you get the answers right. <laughs> I have to send like virtual snacks through the internet or something. <laughs> and this one, you might not know the answer to this because we really haven't gone deep diving into data formats. So take an educated guess on this one. Which of those data formats is the most lightweight? Meaning, for the same amount of data that you want to send, which of these will have the smallest size payload? Like, let's say you're sending 100 records through from the same object. So JSON is smaller than XML. I'm not yeah, sure the I, CSV I would fit. Yeah, I would guess the CSV file would be smaller than JSON, but I don't know. I would guess so. JSON. But maybe not. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think CSV. Okay. At Trailhead DX, they said it was CSV. The reason being JSON, every time you send data from a certain field, you have to repeat that field's name yeah, yeah. in the JSON right. format. That's what I was thinking, yeah. yeah Whereas CSV, names. you have the header row with the field yeah. names, and everything else is just pure data. Right. Gotcha. So the only extra overhead is the commas and maybe some quotes around some text fields. So there you go. Don't know if it'll come up, but it was on the slides at Trailhead. So maybe it might help you on an exam. All right. And then we have a couple of mock exam questions. And I'll let you guys read this to yourselves and tell me what the answer is. And Terry, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> I have to remember the answer too. <laughs> I wish Meet would allow us to do like little polls or whatever, like where you could answer. Oh, I know that would be great. I was I was trying to think if there was some way to do that. I think Slack does actually, but uh, we had played it with a robot. I don't know if we can just do it in hmm. people. Should, I think it might be a plugin. I think for Slack. Huh. We should check that out. <laughs> um. But yeah, I think somebody I think posted C in the comments as the answer. Anybody have any other options they want to pick? No, it's C. Yeah, yeah, I would say C. Okay. All right, but let's talk about A for a second. Go back to slide 12. So what is this data loader with default settings? Terry, you wrote this question. So tell me about, because some people might lean toward A, because data loader can handle a million records. So why not data loader? Yeah, I, I put the what's default because data, data loader can also do a bulk API, can it not? Yeah, there's a checkbox the in the settings. Yeah, yeah, the default is not bulk. So. But the default is not bulk. Yeah, that's that's why I added that 
uh, clarification. Yep. And, and that is exactly the kind of answers that you would get on a real exam where it's almost right, but it's not quite right. <laughs> And you just got to know the nuances to be able to answer it. So well done, Terry. You are a future exam writer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, slide 13, please. And we talked about this one a while, so hopefully everybody knows the answer to this one. Nobody wants to shout it out first. I'm going to say metadata, API. Okay. Yeah. Yep, and Surabi also says A. Why not C? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Who's got the horn? The celebration horn. <laughs> oh, the, sorry, yeah. my puppy. <laughs> oh, that was perfect. I thought that was like you know you were cheering the right answer. <laughs> no, I I have a puppy. It's it's oh we got our AC back, so she's awake now and. Um, she is squeaking around. So, um, yeah, you would, you, you would say ant because ant isn't an API. It's a tool that you tool, can use right. to, uh, with the metadata API to migrate changes from a sandbox to a production board. Yep. And again, this is the kind of thing that, that you might see on an exam where, yes, you use ant for migrating, but the question specifically says which API. So it's that one word that makes the difference between answering A instead of answering C. So keep an eye out for those tricky little things. All right, so where are we now? Um, this is the study schedule. Last week, we looked at high-level integration capabilities. This week, everybody's favorite topic, security. And fortunately, this is not the identity and access management study group class, so we don't have to go super deep into it. But what we're looking at for here, actually, the, more on the next slide on what we're doing. So if you could move to slide 15, please. So this week's study plan, the top two aren't really study plans, they're action items, but what you're studying is security is what do you need to do, what needs to happen inside Salesforce for you to be able to talk to other systems? What do you need to do to allow other systems to communicate with you? What do you need to do to be able to communicate with outside systems? And what options are available? And again, we don't need to know the nitty gritty of how OAuth works for this. We just need to know what OAuth does for this. Maybe at a high level, know what, how it works. Um, and also this thing called integration considerations. And there, those keywords are pulled directly from the study guide. So I will post resources no later than tomorrow, links from the trailhead um, trail mix that deal with this stuff. Again, as you're finding other links that are valuable, please add them to the integration architecture sheet. There is a separate tab for study resources. And then also two um, action items. Add your photo on the Slack profile so we can get to know your lovely smiling face. And then find somebody that's going to help keep you accountable on this because and I am I am just as guilty of this as everybody else. Like I said, if you're going to do the study group, commit to studying every day, doing a little bit every day. And I didn't do that this week. So I, like everybody else, need somebody to stay on top of me and say, hey, are you sticking to your commitment to yourself to do this thing you've set out to do? So I... I ask you to find somebody in your life, whether that's somebody in your personal circle of friends or loved ones or a coworker that will help keep you accountable to this. I don't recommend a boss because that's just too high stakes, although maybe you need the high stakes. I don't know. Um, and then also find somebody in the group. You heard some of the group introductions earlier today about, you know, favorite superheroes, favorite snacks, um, or if there's something else you see in common with another person, reach out to them, say, hey, can you just be my study buddy to help check in with me once in a while and help keep me on track? Um, questions or comments here? All right, slide 16, please. Uh, any questions on anything we've covered tonight? Okay. Well, then we're going to call this meeting done. I'll stay on the line till everybody hangs up just to make sure nobody gets abandoned. Um, and that slide is up because last week we ended the meeting at 7.30 and somebody tried to join at 8 o'clock and <laughs> they were wondering why nobody was there. So, but since my computer doesn't want to present today, I won't be putting that slide up anyway. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, 